new book just came out from Scott, Johnston, Steve House and with the influence of Kilian Jornet. It's Training for the Uphill Athlete, a manual for mountain runners and ski mountaineers. So, you know, like in the last 20 years, I've been reading and training and coaching and helping and advising. So for sure that in a book like this, there will be actually nothing new that I haven't checked, read, analyzed, tried, tested. However, you know, like it's, it's, uh, I'm not saying this to put down the book at all. No, 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 it's a fantastic book. It's a great book. I haven't read it yet. However, I started reading it and I will make a small video about each section what you can find in the book because these guys are really thinking, testing and checking. They don't just read the science and put away stuff what science dismisses. They try it first and they will see that, okay, this thing works against the science or this thing is more important. And, you know, like they, they put together a good coaching Bible for uphill athletes, for mountain runners, mountain bikers, you know, like it's not specialty for cycling, but really mountain bikers, cyclists can use it as well because, you know, like it's a great, great book. Uh, the first uh, time I uh, met these two guys, I mean, their work, it was uh, training for the new alpinism. It was a great, great book because, you know, I learned some basic uh, movements, tools, knots, rope handling, ice axes, ice axe use, uh, you know, like all kind of ice to usage and uh, assuring and all, all kind of stuff, you know, I wanted to learn just, just the basics a little bit. Of course, I went really deep in it, but for practical reasons and for my practice, I learned on the basics for this. And, you know, these guys uh, came up with this new training guide for the uphill athlete. So I, I uh, just uh, made a couple of notes about what you can read in the very first chapter, the section on physiology of endurance. So they mention, of course, the Tim Noakes' central governor theory. Uh, they use some uh, system approach, systems type of approach, you know, like explain uh, how, how systems approach work. They explain some basics of the metabolism, glucose, fat metabolism, the, the aerobic threshold, lactate threshold. Uh, there is uh, the study of uh, Dr. Verhoshaski, uh, what is a kind of block training system for middle distance runners, uh, loads of aerobic training, speed efficiency, little aerobic critical speed, fat adaptations, diet fasting, uh, not too much uh, um, emphasis on diets and stuff, you know, like, so there are three very important things for me in this chapter, what a lot of new coaches dismiss and do not understand. And, you know, like these were for me, the things what I would, I would like have read in the past, you know, like when I really started my journey as a coach and, and an endurance athlete that, you know, things what clients asked from me should have been denied straight away and I should have put those clients into that place uh, to make them understand that they cannot have what they want now because they are not ready and they should practice other stuff to be able to ready for the show, for the things what they want now, later on and do them properly. So the first thing is aerobic deficiency syndrome. So first of all, in any training books, what you know, like are really about endurance, any coaching books, you do not have the name Phil Maffeton mentioned. Nobody mentions this in this book. They talk about it and it's not like he's coined the face that aerobic deficiency syndrome, but you know, like it's, uh, it's really strange for me to see like his type of work, you know, a hard zone to approach, a submax approach, a maximum aerobic function approach in a book like this. And it's, this is why it's interesting for me 
because you know I, I won't learn new things from the book for sure but I refresh the things I know and it might trigger researches towards other subjects what I didn't know so it's uh, it's very interesting so even then they accept and they promote a very correct aerobic base and the maintenance of that aerobic base and then you can supplement this aerobic base with triggers of uh, hard 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 exercises before you reach a certain level when you revert back to that endurance base but of course that homeostatic level will be now a lot higher so for instance you start a maximum aerobic function period when you run on a certain heart rate for a very long time let's say for two months you run on 140 heart rate most of the time for two months like or one between 135 and 145 your pace will slowly increase and then plateau then you start adding some interval training you decrease the speed and the heart rate of some runs to recover from these interval sessions and you actually uh, diverting towards a proper 90 10 or 80 20 approach for a couple of weeks depending on athlete and the volume uh, what the athlete can handle and then you revert back to this zone 2 type of base aerobic training but now on a higher level so when you started out at the beginning you were having let's say 4 minute 30 kilometer pace for the 140 heart rate then at the end of that aerobic base it was already down to like 410 kilometer pace and during that speed phase you did not actually test there is no point because your focus was on speed and then you went back to that aerobic base and after a couple of easier days when you are recovered you might do the test and you see that you have like 355 pace on the same heart rate that you had at the very beginning tested let's say three months ago what was like 420 or 430 pace and this is how it works tuck, 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 tuck. it's a small it's a small wavy hill what is going slowly slowly upwards tending towards upwards and this is like the method of method this is a submax method this is a zone 2 a deep zone 2 method from the book of joe freer this is how actually Lydiard and the Kenyan athletes work that they had 10 15 years of walking running easy experience before they started to get into this hardcore 150 200 mile training week type of endurance uh, workouts training um, technique coaching this is what they emphasize so what will you do with a beginner runner or with a runner who starts with you and what would you what would you recommend let's say there were the 10 recommendations of Alberto Salazar and it wasn't one of them so get a coach or somebody who knows biomechanics and at least has a good eye and look at your make, make, make them look at you how you run the advantage of a coach that straight away not only he can see but he can propose you workouts that enhance your technique so athletic schooling drills uh, landing some special strength training to 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 be a better athlete to improve your posture to well, a lot of things you know a coach a running coach can recommend you uh, many many things that are not a workout are not pace based or heart rate based or whatever based but exercise based exercises to be a better runner so when you go out for those long adventures later on you won't be injured so a coach who can actually correct you who can lead you towards a better running form and you know like you don't see this in books it's so basic it's nothing it's really nothing it's like you don't even have to think about it but it's the first advice and the thing is that it's cheap so you book a session of like two and a half hours with a coach that's what I recommend you know two and a half hours and you talk a lot you walk through a lot of stuff you jog a lot and 
you practice a lot. In two and a half hours, you know, like you can, you can, you can get everything done. You pay hundred bucks, and then you get back to that coach in like two or three months to see the improvements. Uh, it's so easy. Just you know, even in like 60, 70, 90 minutes, you can get a lot of things done. But you know, like if if your coach really want to dig deep into all the issues you have. You know, the two, two and a half hours, of course, with a lot of small pauses, it's not like two and a half hours of running or strength training, a lot of small pauses and two and a half hours, you know, like everything you can be talk about, check, run, mobility, a bit of a break in between when you, when you, when you, when you check other stuff like, like breathing and posture and you're just done. And for two, three months, you can practice that. The third thing I marked here, high intensity interval training, no shortcut to endurance. There is no freaking shortcut to endurance. You cannot actually do short burst of interval sessions to increase your endurance. I mean, you can, in addition to your proper zone two marathon type, whatever submax type endurance training, however, you cannot replace those outings those low heart rate, long outings, you cannot replace them with high intensity interval training. Impossible. You need to get that base done. You need to work on those slow twitch fibers to increase the number of mitochondria that creates energy and ATP and all the stuff. And uh, you, you have to get out and work out and work on those lower correct heart rates. So the thing is that most people actually don't know that what, what I'm talking about right now, even if they think, okay, I just go out and jog. No, no, it's a specific low heart rate. So for instance, I go out for a jog and just enjoy myself. There is nothing happen at all. Or I go out for a run and just run by my feel and I just push it hard and do two hours. There will also nothing happen. So the thing is that the specialty aerobic heart rate zone, it's about a 10 beat zone. It's, it's measured by, let's say by methadone, it's 180 minus your age, minus 10. So it, it gives you a 10 beat range. Or you can really, if you're a really healthy person, you can do a, a fat burning test, I would say. It's a gas exchange ratio test. So when you really uh, start switching uh, into sugar burning state, uh, that would be your max aerobic function heart rate and you subtract 10 and you know like you would be a, an efficient runner in between those heart rates. So for me as a 37 year old healthy I did not add the 5 yet. You, you will see later on what is, what is this about. So 37 year old, 143 minus 10, 133. This is my aerobic heart rate, 133 to 143. I do most of my workouts in between these heart rate zones. And actually, if I did anything under, it's most likely the warming up or I do some walking workout on hard, steep hills. But if I went out for a three hour jog, it would be really slow, annoying and also not really beneficial for me personally what I want to do at this moment to run on those heart rates and it would give me nothing at all. If I would be running over because of my life, my job and what I want to reach over 143, 145, I would be stressing my body too much that would it would take away, it would take away uh, effort for the other things I want to do in life or the efforts for the next training sessions. And this is why I sprinkle in some lactate threshold workouts because that will, won't fatigue me and will bring great benefits. And actually the next chapter, what I will talk about later on in the next video, will emphasize lactate threshold workouts as well because those intensities are really, really beneficial for endurance. However, not that taxing like a 15 times 400 hardcore on the track. So, uh, no shortcut to endurance by high intensity interval training, despite that many athletes try and perform 
on a paleo diet and vegan diet, whatever, and doing only like hardcore high intensity, three times one hour stuff a week. And after they realized, shit, that 50k run did not go as well as I wanted. So yes, and uh, this is an interesting fact, what I really like, because you won't see this. Over 12 hours, if you do over 12 hours of endurance training a week, in this case, diet will actually not affect endurance and probably fat burning either. I mean, if you check a person who eats properly, like let's say two or three times a day, regardless it's 100% carb or 100% fat, really radical, but whatever, their diet will not affect the endurance, what they can have and the fat burning, what they can have during the actual activity. So yeah, probably if you eat a lot of fat during your day and during your life, you will be burning more fat because you don't have actually carbs coming into the system. And when you eat carbs, probably you will start burning fat during your lifestyle after you got digested those carbs and after your blood sugar is regulated and after that, you know, everything passed. There is a discussion, there can be a discussion about this, that what is better, like let's say uh, not having any sugar or having some sugar, having fast acting sugar and then back to homeostatic level or having slow acting sugar, but having a higher level for longer before it returns to homeostatic levels, whatever, we don't care. You know, like if you train over 12 hours a week and a lot of people would say, oh my God, 12 hours is a lot. And others would say it's one bike ride and one run. You know, like you go out for a, a 10 hour bike ride and a two hour run. <laughs> Loads of people would say that, okay, it's like two days of training. So 12 hours of training uh, in endurance <clears throat> and your diet will not have really an effect on your endurance and on your training and whatever, you know. And most of us, you know, like train a lot more than 12 hours already. So in this case, diet might have an effect and will have an effect on recovery, on inflammation, on proper energy levels and a lot of stuff. But on your fat burning rate and endurance, no. This is why I say uh, most of the time that your diet doesn't matter until you eat real foods, whole foods, mostly raw, mostly fresh, raw, ripe, organic, hand-picked, in-season fruits and vegetables if you want some meat. So I don't care if you were a vegan, if you were a paleo, if you were high fat, if you were low fat, high carb, I don't care. If you eat whole foods, vegetables, the correct proportions in the correct time of the day and you do not use a lot of condiments and stimulants like caffeine, chocolate, condiments like hard spices all the time. For instance, I find that a lot of athletes have gut issues if they use like a lot of chili and black pepper. A lot of athletes have gut issues if they use a lot of oils like coconut oil and olive oil, like too much. Uh, some athletes uh, cannot actually uh, eat a lot of carbs because they have a tendency to have cravings for other carbs. So you eat a lot of rice and you eat a lot of uh, melons and bananas and cooking potatoes and because of that sugary carby feeling you cannot dissociate it's, it's a mind problem it's not a metabolic problem it's a mind problem so you cannot dissociate for cookies and cakes and stuff whatever you know like those people might be better off with a moderate carb higher fat diet but it's it's, it's just semant semantics it's it's easy so whatever uh, the first section of the book was about this. Uh, they describe what is endurance, they describe how the metabolism is going on, and also you can find a lot of interesting uh, adventures of Kilian Jordan and Dakota Jones and uh, getting uh, their ideas and uh, some posts, articles from them in the book. So that was about section one and my opinion about the section one. Section two is coming soon.